many people these days are spending so much time broadcasting and no time receiving. So by that, I mean, you are constantly focused on what you are doing, what you can tell other people you're doing. Um, the Johan in his book said, I would be sitting in the beginning, I would be sitting looking at a sunset and I would be thinking in my brain, if I took this picture, here's how I would caption it so everyone could see it, right? You're constantly thinking about how do I create content for other people to consume yeah. instead of being present with the sunset and being like, what is it like for me right now to be in the, I'm, I'm receiving this sunset without thinking about how I can chop that into a bite-sized piece that somebody else can get. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 65 of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips-Buck, VP of Student Success, and I'm going to be joined today by Matt Boisvert, our president. He had some technical difficulties, so he's going to join me in just... Oh, wow. I'm trying... That was really good. We had some camera trouble. So thanks for joining yeah. me. Um, okay. Well, we are going to talk about noise cancellation today, how we can live deeper, less distracted lives. Um, <clears throat> and we will dive into that topic in just a moment. But I have a little chit chat for you. So Matt, you know that our um, theme of the year is joyful. So it I is. have a couple of things that I want to show you that make me feel joyful. The first if you're joining us by podcast, I will try to describe this. So the first is, this is my cup of coffee. First of all, Matt is our uh, resident barista. <laughs> so he makes our coffee for us. And this says, my family bought this for me. Nothing messes up your Friday more than realizing it's a Wednesday. They bought that for me after I spent a whole day signing my emails, happy Thursday. And then as I was leaving, someone was like, it's Wednesday. So that was <laughs> Also, though, look, I have this little hat that I put on it, so it keeps it warm. It has little bunny ears. Can you see that? So this makes Thank me feel you. very joyful. Yeah. Also, my daughter is obsessed with dad jokes, and so she told me um, two on the way to school this morning. Would you like to hear them? All right. Let's okay. hear them. The first one is I got a really terrible thesaurus today. Not only is it rubbish, it's also rubbish. <laughs> that <was> funny. <laughs> That's great. Okay. And then the other one is, I'm not sure the meaning of the word, word Armageddon, but it's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Good dad. Like, yeah. So did she get a book of these or? Yeah. So she went and helped Clint teach his class the other day, my husband. And so I gave him a book of dad jokes for Christmas. And so she and he looked through and found the best ones, but I thought those were pretty good. Actually, I'm going to keep those in my back pocket in case someone's like Great. tell jokes. Um, okay. Do you have anything that you want to talk about before we dive into state of the union? And we have some great ones today for State of the Union. So the first one, I'm sorry, I missed this. I don't know when this conversation happened, but apparently we are going to simplify the FAFSA. Um, they wanted to have a simplified FAFSA out by October 1st, which is the launch date for FAFSA since 2016. However, financial aid administrators at colleges and universities are very concerned. Mm -hmm. They are saying that the lack of time and guidance from the U S department of education are barriers that they are facing. Um, and so they're basically like, we're not sure we can get this done by October. It's kind of a harsh critique. They're like, not only did you not give us time or guidance, we don't have enough staff in our financial aid offices and we don't have confidence that our SIS which is collecting a lot of data from the FAFSA is going to be ready for this change either. So I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if they'll push back the date or if they'll delay it a year or what their plan is. But the good news, I think, coming out of this article is that the FAFSA is going to be simplified because it is a beast. It is a beast. Them. It is a barrier. So that is yeah. good news. Yeah. Okay. Um, this coming out of the University of Iowa, I love this. They just have put an emphasis on how guiding students on how to learn. They're like, how would students know how to learn? No one's really ever taught them that for the most part. 
Um, so they launched a learning at Iowa <clears throat> last year in a pilot. This is directly to support students in how to learn. So there's a couple of elements in orientation. They do a faculty-led session on the expectations of college coursework. And then a couple of weeks later, they do an asynchronous onboarding course called Success at Iowa, which introduces students to the university resources and also topics on personal development. They have three pillars, which I think is really, really powerful. Their first one is mindset which they teach a growth mindset, this idea that you can change or develop if you work hard. The second is metacognition. So thinking about thinking, they're trying to help students realize whether or not they're taking steps forward in their learning or if they're really stuck on a task. So let's think about how you're thinking about this problem. And then the last one is memory. And they're teaching them strategies for studying and test taking and instead of like cramming in ineffective techniques, here's how you can really learn for tests. So 25 departments, mm -hmm. academic and administrative are partnered with learning at Iowa. <clears throat> and next year they're planning on pulling in res life so that RAs and RDs can be trained in those three M's so that they can use this consistent language in helping students learn, which I think is so smart. I think it's yeah. maybe a, a part that we miss for freshmen. Like you might have a, a session about it in orientation, but to weave it throughout and to talk about you can do better if you try harder, think about how you're thinking about it. And then here are some actual strategies for how to be successful. I really love. That's great. Really good. Yeah. Um, this next one is well worth an entire read. So this is how these HBCU presidents fix their college's financial futures. I think this is a season for HBCUs. Um, there's changing climate, right? We all know this. We have a um, enrollment cliff coming. The Pew Parenting in America survey just found that only 41% of parents say it's important for their children to have a college degree, which is down 94% from yeah. 2012. In 2012, it was 94%. Yes. yes. Yeah. And 2023, so this is current, is 41%. Wow. Um, but historical black colleges and universities, their undergrad enrollment is up 2.5% compared to a national decline of 4.2%. It's one of the only bright spots for the 2022 National Student Clearinghouse data. We know that they've had a long history of being um, financially underfunded. Uh, sure. In fact, they were underfunded by almost $13 billion compared to their counterparts. So this article just goes into, here's the history of how these schools got here, um, looking at the data of how we're getting new money coming into those schools, but they highlight three schools, Dillard University in New Orleans, their president um, got, a gift, uh, got a gift of $5 million. When he came to the university, he realized that Dillard was number two in the country for producing African-Americans who get undergraduate degrees in physics many of them women. And he was like, so I just went out and told everybody that's what we do really, really well. And people are like, we'll give you money for that. That's amazing. Yeah, so that's amazing. Um, he increased alumni giving from 4% to 23%. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> it's so good. So that is a amazing success story. They also highlight uh, Cheney University, which is near uh, Philadelphia. They were in financial ruin. They own $35, $35 million to the state of Pennsylvania. Aaron Walton in 2017 came. He faced a $7.5 million deficit. He eliminated the football team, saving $2 million. Let's just pause on that for a second. There's Hold a lot to be said about $2 million for the football team. Yeah. He got rid of open admissions, which resulted in hundreds of students in remediation. Um, today, the budget has been balanced for four years. Enrollment is up from 469 at the end of his first year now to 707 students. And he got the state to give the uh, $35 million. Awesome job. So there's a lot more details about that. But he's just someone who came from business and was like, I'm going to turn this school around. The state forgave the $35 million debt. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And then awesome. finally, Howard University, their president, Wayne Frederick, 
he is taking that school to be in the next year, the first billion dollar HBCU school, billion dollar endowment. Um, he raised $170 million in private donations. And in the next year, like I said, he's going to hit a billion dollars in endowment. Matt, I love this though. So you know that um, I think a year or so ago, what's her name? Mackenzie Scott, who was married to Jeff Bezos, pledged to give millions of dollars to HBCUs, yeah. saying that is where they need the money most. Well, this school, uh, Howard, got some of her money. She gave them $40 million. But the $40 million from McKinsey Scott, he says the untold part of that story is that McKinsey Scott was a teaching assistant for to Tony Morrison, the famous author. So wow. when it came time to give that money, she was like, I want to make sure that I honor my teacher who I thought was so amazing. And so that kind of chain is one of the reasons why Howard University got that. And the president just says, that's a great example. We have alumni who have been really well impacted by our teachers and faculty and by other alumni. And that's how you tell the story of HBCUs. So yeah. awesome article. I was that's really great. excited to see about those turnarounds. Okay, just a few more. So, you know, we've been talking about chatbot. Everybody's talking about chatbot. I told you that there were two different like chatbot detectors. One was from OpenAI. One is called uh, chat or what is it? GPT zero, I think is what it's called. Those are problematic because they can't tell you for sure that this student is cheating. They're like, well, there's a probability. Well, turn it in who you are familiar with because faculty are asking their students to turn in essays now and turn it in is telling whether or not they've been plagiarized. They in April are going to launch their uh, AI detector. And they say that their AI detector is capable of identifying 97% of text as written by chat GPT with a less than 1% false positive rate. So that is a big improvement over those other ones. You could maybe go to your students and say like, hey, there's a less than 1% chance that you actually wrote yeah. that. That's so, going to be awesome. That will be interesting. Okay, two more for you. This is really interesting. The education department is talking about building a list of low-value college programs. The emphasis there is low financial value to students. So you have until, um, I think it's, well, this is the end of the month. So this month to provide feedback. But basically... There's a lot of people who are critical of this. They are just saying, how can you define what, what the value of our college is? Um, it, there's not a metric that's going to determine the value across all majors, across the country, of, across all colleges and universities. And in fact, there's a lot of these schools that are saying they would really like to have a social value multiplier. So in other words, like, I might be a teacher. I don't make a lot of money, but I would feel like my college was valuable because of the impact that I'm having on the culture and the world, which I think for schools we serve is particularly important Yeah, because we're not always looking for a degree that is going to make us the most money. A lot of times we are just looking to be able to impact the world for good using our gifts. And so that's a pretty interesting discussion, I think. Okay, and then my last one, I don't, I'm not gonna share this article source with you. I mean, it's not a secret, it's inside higher ed, but I just think it's awesome because this uh, Bellin College is, has created their Student Success Center and they are offering games and fidgets for community members to take a brain break during their study cycle. So they have fidget toys, coloring sheets, they have slime, they have games, they have bubbles. The director of the, bub or of the bubble center, of the Student Success Center was like, <laughs> me a side eye about bubbles, but listen, <clears throat> my personal favorite brain break, because you have to do breath work. So you have to inhale and you have to breathe out. And so it helps calm everybody down. Um, she was able to, she did a couple of other things. Like she renamed tutors to student support uh, coaches as a result of fidget spinners and some renaming and some reprogramming, their visits jumped uh, 94% and the number of coaching ses sessions rose by 155%. So you and I were talking about percentages are weird, right? Because it can be a small end, yeah. but whatever it was, oh, it's way it's more than it was before. Yeah. So 
I love that. Just the idea that we have to um, give our students a place to decompress a little bit. And as you and I are going to be talking about today, this one of the outcomes of very deep thinking is that you need to come out of it and like come up for air every once in a while. Right. So, yeah, that is the state of the union. Thank you, Rachel. All right. So let's dive into our topic today. Um, I want to maybe give a little precursor about why we're going to be talking about this and then we will dive in. So we are talking about re reducing distractions <clears throat> and replacing that with something else. Why are you laughing? Because you're super it distracted. Great irony. Right <laughs> I, am, I am so, my focus has been so stolen uh, over the past 30 minutes that I, I, anyone watching today is wondering what is going on with Matt. Yeah, it's fine. We're just, you're, you're doing a great job. Just stick with me. Okay. No, I, I think I'm good. I, okay. I think I've you're back. Settled. Yeah. All right. So reducing distractions, we are going to make an argument today that this actually is a way to increase joy in your life, right? Because you are able to be fully present yeah. and focused on the task at hand <laughs> instead of like, is my camera okay? Is my mic on? Can everybody see me? Well, what's wrong? What happened? Yeah. Why, right. is it, why are all of my settings wrong? <laughs> but know? also... These are, these are things they didn't have to worry about back in the 1800s. True. You know what I mean? Very true. Yeah. Um, I also think about this, though, in terms of perhaps explaining some of the things we're seeing in our students, oh, that sure. this sort of fractured attention, especially coming out of three years of really crazy business. Um, so I, I, I want to take this and apply it both to our lives, but also to how we can talk to our students about this, this piece. So I, I would just say like the underlying thesis of our conversation today is that a life full of distractions is actually a diminished life. So by that, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, it's very stressful. But second of all, when you are distracted, you can't pay sustained attention to important things. And if you can't pay attention to important things, you can't achieve important things, right? right. We focus our effort on our energy and our focus on, I don't know if you can focus your focus, but you focus your focus on the things that are most important, the things that you want to achieve. And if you're distracted constantly, that's impossible. And so you can't live a, a full life. Um, Matt, you and I learned years and years ago when we started working with developers, the cost that it takes to get back into a deep thinking process yeah. is not, it's not like a momentary distraction. It's like, the, the science says it takes 23 minutes on average to once you come up for air or you get a text message on your phone or something comes in through your email and you stop thinking, the recovery time to get back where you are is 23 minutes. Right. And so that in and of itself, if you're thinking about a special project or something that needs your attention, I counted this morning because we were going to talk about this. This morning I had, and I, I have very few notifications on my phone. So I had local news tell me about something that happened in a local high school. Right. I had the weather tell me it was going to be a beautiful day. I had my mm -hmm. daughter's teacher text me and that's a whole rigmarole. And I had to like text back and forth, text back and forth. I have my calendar dings like, Hey, you have a meeting that's coming up next. I have our company chat that's dinging all the time. And then I have my email. So that's, and I have a pretty limited notification. That's six things this morning as I was trying to think deeply about thinking deeply that <laughs> pulled my attention away from this focused, deep thinking. So that is not a fulfilled life, right? I'm not doing my best work when I'm, I'm constantly being pulled in these different places. That's okay. Right. Another thing I would say about this is when attention breaks down, your problem solving breaks down. So I think one of the results that we're seeing, not only with our students, but across our country, is that when you can't focus, you are drawn into simplistic explanations. So it is either good or it's bad, it's wrong or it's right, you're good or you're bad, right? We don't, the nuance and the, and the complex thinking to understand all of the different things that go into a system, 
or a conversation or an experience. You just don't have time for it because you are not used to that kind of complicated, uh, <clears throat> right? There's no wrestle. You just have, you don't have the time you, to really focus on the wrestle and really with these complex problems that we're looking at today, um, you really need to spend the time to do some complex problem solving and uh, good deep thinking, not this kind of uh, shortcut thinking, I think that a lot of us are doing um, and how and how we approach the solving the problem. You know, it's funny because as you say that, what it what occurs to me is it's like when we were talking about this AI bot, right? And it's like the, yeah, the right. easy solution is for it to tell you a thing and for you to be like, oh, that's true. The, <clears throat> the complex thinking is when you go in and you say, okay, let me do research. Is that true? What did this say? What's the context? What are these other, other pieces? It's a great example yeah. of like, just tell me what it is versus hold on, hold on. We got to hold space to think deeply about this. Exactly right. Yep. So I love this topic today because... Um, when I think about us just generally, um, you know, as we think about our personal goals and our professional goals and thinking about our future plans and honestly get kind of stuck or, or feel frustration because we're not making progress. This is the reason I, it all starts to click for me. That idea of, of stolen focus, being distracted, not having the time to really focus our attention. Um, and, and so then starting to rewire ourselves around. So how, how do I find that time uh, to focus and start paying attention to the things that matter to me? That's yeah, why I, I really love this topic. Well, you saying that makes me think about how, you know, we have a lot of very big problems in higher education that we've got to fix. We've got to do right. things differently. We, we are facing a lot of really big problems. And so often, even within our offices, we're talking about those big problems. And then it's like, oh, but wait, I've got to go take care of this thing. Oh, but wait, I have this other thing. Right. And so right. we can't solve those problems if we don't give it dedicated attention. Right. So one element that we're trying to do today is, you know, you can address a thing if you can name it. And I think so many of us have the sort of internal, like unconscious knowledge that we have fractured attention on so many different things, but being able to name the difference between distractions and what we're going to talk about, which is flow, is really, really vital in deep thinking. Okay, so this is actually coming out of a book. It's called Stolen Focus. It's by Johan Hari. Um, I am I am going to be humble, aka humiliated, in <laughs> admitting that I've had this book, I think, for three years. <laughs> I only got through the intro. I didn't even get through the introduction. I got like halfway through the introduction and then I put it down and I didn't pick it up. And it just has been like shaming me from my bookshelf, like Rachel, hello. So I'm really happy to be able to talk be talking about it today because it has given me purpose to dive into it. It's been so long we forgot who recommended it. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know who I do not rem I don't remember why I got this book. It might be because I was feeling fractured and I was like, I have to solve this, but then I didn't even have enough attention to get through the intro. So that's pretty yeah. bad. But this came out of this gentleman who was like, something is not right in my life. I need to take a break from all this distraction and notification. I'm going to go. He decided to go for three months to Provincetown, which is a little town in the Atlantic, North Atlantic. Um, <clears throat> he got rid of his phone and his computer. He said he had to dig up a watch. He's like, okay, well, I have to tell time. He needed an alarm clock. He took his iPod so he could listen to music. He found a jitterbug, which you know, this is the phone that doesn't, it's not a smartphone. It's, it's designed for older people. It's like literally like you can call 911 on it. That's basically all oh, you right. can do. And then he had a friend who had a broken laptop that he could only do like word processing. He couldn't connect to the internet. So that's what he decided to take. And he went to this little town and was like, I'm just going to stay here for three months and I'm just going to see what it's like to be distracted. And he talks actually a lot about how he was panicked in the beginning. He kept like patting his, his uh, pocket, like, where's my phone? 
what if I get lost? What's going to happen? Like just all of these things that he was experiencing. And the first day he just walked around the town and looked around. He said it was really a, an interesting experience to be fully present in where he was. And here's what he says. He, he actually walked until 2 a.m. in the morning on the beach, just watching the waves and just reflecting and doing some deep thinking. He said, I walked back to the beach house alone at 2 a.m. I thought about the difference between the glowing blue light I had spent so much of my life staring at, which keeps you always alert, and the natural light that had faded all around me, which seemed to say, the day is over, rest now. The beach house was empty. There were no text or voice messages or emails waiting for me, or if there were, I wouldn't know for three months. I climbed into bed and <laughs> fell into the deepest sleep I could remember. I didn't awake until 15 hours later. Which that sounds pretty heavenly to me. <clears throat> yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask you, Rachel, when when was I don't know lately, have you ever had a day where you just totally unplugged and like just a day? No, I cannot remember. But you know, I used to all growing up, I would go to camp all summer and we had no electricity in the cabins, and this was before cell phones. Yeah. And so all summer long, when the lights went out, like you go to bed and then you wake up in the morning. And I I just love the analogy of this sort of lie that our screens tell us that they're always ready. They're always ready for work. We can always be productive. And at the same time, it is not productive. It's, it's like churning and distracted and shallow and right. All of those kinds of things. And the difference to night and day, which is says it's day, let's work hard. It's night. Let's rest. Right. So I think that's really important. As you're saying that, I'm thinking about how what we're doing these days, like our lives may just feel like this is just the way it is. It's just the way I I run. Yeah. But and and so you might think, well, that's that's just naturally the way it goes. And it's just not natural, right? Like it is artificial. Yeah. And it's exactly. only in in a short and and really like what, since 2006, maybe? This is the kind of frantic, it's continued to just continue and grow when we we went from letters to emails, okay, and then maybe AIM or whatever the yeah. messenger was back in the day. But where we are now is, I mean, we have to step back and say it's frantic, Right. Yeah. And part of why I think this is so important for us to talk to our students about is we can remember when it wasn't like that. And you have students who don't have that knowledge. They, right. they can't think of a time when they weren't able to just constantly be distracted by things. And so when I think of student development, how do we teach them to do that? Well, part of how we teach them, you and I were saying like, this is a rough topic because I'm really distracted. I, I am barely present these days because yeah. I have so many things going on. So we have to fix that for ourselves. We also have to like put a stake in the ground and say, there is a time where we were not constantly at the beck and call of our blue light screen, which pretends like we can be productive all the time, but really sucks time and energy and attention away from us. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So there's a lot of science in this book. Um, I would recommend that you read it, but I would just say what science says about depth, about creating deep thinking is that it takes time. It takes space for reflection. It takes active energy, commitment, and attention. So I'm going to say those again, because I think each of those are helpful. We could spend a lot of time on each of them, but it takes time. It takes active reflection. It takes energy, commitment, and attention. And so the kind of summary of that, Matt, you weren't with me, but a couple of weeks ago, we've talked about, we talked about purchase and practice, which you and I have talked about for years and years and years. Yeah. And the idea that this idea of practice is suffering, right? It is hard work that you are investing in this thing. It is an investment. That's it is right. an investment. And sometimes if we're not committed to that, I feel like when we think about doing deep thinking, there's a part of my brain that is constantly like, please distract me. It's why when I'm thinking deep and my phone goes off, I'm not like, oh no. I'm like, oh, something's happened, right? I should pay attention to that. Here's this other thing. Oh, look, this thing. 
there is a part that is not self-disciplined that is constantly looking for an out. That's um, right. Yeah. To, to, to forgive the fact, like, I don't have to do this hard thing. There's something else that I could just do right now. Right. Instead of that, you've heard me say, I mean, I, my brain is like this anyway, but you've heard me say my friend, I kept, we were studying and I kept interrupting her with like, Hey, this funny thing. And she finally made a sign on one side. She had play time and the other side, she had study time. And she would put it up on our table and it would say study time. And then every time it distracted her, she would give me an exasperated look and turn it around to play time until I finished telling her my story. And then she would turn it back to study time, like focus, right? Subtle reminder for you. Right, right, exactly. So I think our students are both eager for deep thinking, but also very willing to be distracted, just like we are, right? Yeah, I'm just thinking about the years of of um, that underdeveloped muscle of deep thinking for them, yes, right? that's right. And you layer on top of the fact that we carry a computer around in our pocket that can distract us at all times. You layer on top of that the fact that they are coming out of a once a century event where you and I were saying, um, sometimes when things are really, really awful, you want easily consumable, distractible stuff. Like, I don't want to be present in what's happening right now. I want to go to another sure. place where I can just play Candy Crush and not have to think about real things, right? Right. That's right. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that TikTok exploded during COVID. Yeah, really. for sure. Yeah. So another thing that science says is that although we um, have coined this phrase multitasking, it is not true. We juggle. Oh. We are able to bounce from one thing to another, to another, to another, but we actually cannot hold multiple tasks or thoughts in our head at one time. And so, um, I mean, it's that, like not possible, but yeah. So like neuroscientists are like, no, I can see where each of those thoughts are in your brain. And they definitely are not happening at the same time. You are bouncing, but it's not like those sections are lit up at the same time. Right. So one of the things that we've developed over time is our um, prefrontal cortex, whose job it is, is to say, you need to focus on the things that are important. So don't listen to your neighbor coughing and don't listen to the chit chat out in the hallway, right? But focus on this thing that is most important, hunting, gathering, whatever that happens to be back in the day. Yeah. And what science is saying now is you can think about your prefrontal cortex as a bouncer at a bar. And so he's really good at like, no, you can't come in. You're just extraneous stimulus. You can't come in. You can't come in. But now that bouncer is like totally overwhelmed with all of the things yep. and all of the tabs and all of the notifications and all of that. And it's getting, t it gets tired and it's not <clears> able to actually protect you from those distractions. And what you said is exactly right, Matt. That is a muscle. Those are connections that you have to practice in order for them to be strong and helpful to you. I was just thinking about my browser tabs. I, I think every time I open my turn, you know, launch my browser, there's 37 tabs at launch. Yeah. And and I'm rethinking that now. Like I thought that was a good way for me to multitask. And as we start getting into this, no, it's a great way to be distracted. Right. And and <laughs> really to jump from one idea to another without the deep thinking. So, yeah. One more thing I want to say about this, and that is the idea that, you know, self-control is, there's a lot of studies on the fact that self-control is finite. So you start your day with 20, um, let's just say ounces of self-control. And every time you give those away, then you're depleted. And so, this like setting yourself up an environment where you're constantly having to use self-control to say, don't pay attention to that. I have 37 tabs open, but I'm going to have self-control and I'm not going to look at them. I have my notifications coming in, but I'm going to have self-control and I'm not going to pay attention to them. Right. Versus set up your environment so that only the most important things come in and you don't have to depend on your self-control because it can be depleted. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what we're building right now is this kind of um, it's like a, a, a culture of just fads, just a just a quick rise, quick fall, 
a, a quick rush, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you have more to say about that? You no. just took a whole trip. Well, my introverted prefrontal cortex is overloaded. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So all of this, all of these distractions degrades our ability to focus. And there's three things that happen when we are constantly distracted. The first one is you have a switch cost effect. So let me explain what that is and then we can talk about it. A switch cost effect is when your brain has to reconfigure when you're going from one thing to another. So a great example of this is um, when I got a text from my daughter's teacher today, as I was typing, I was like, what happened in my brain was I was thinking about something really deeply. And then I got this text and then I was like, oh, right. She's texting me about this thing that happened, this whole thing. Now, what, how am I going to respond? And what's this? And what should I do? And what is she going to think? And blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, okay, now what was I doing? And that space to go from deep thinking to all the switching that I was doing to back is a great cost, right? It takes yeah. a lot of work to, to do that. And so if you think about, if you're looking at your text messages, let's say you look at your screen time and you have four hours of text messages. I, I don't, I mean, I don't think I do four hours of text messages. That seems like a lot, but whatever the number is, you have to then calculate extra switch time. The time it took you to stop what you were doing and pay attention to then this new thing and then get back to what you were doing, right? In this book, it talks about an IQ test where they gave um, people two different tests. One test was with technological distractions. So they had their phone and all their notifications. And the other one was without. It was the difference of 10 IQ points for the same person. So yeah. I believe it. I'll, I'll take yeah. the, I'll put my phone away and take the 10 <laughs> IQ points <laughs> in that deal. So this is just the idea that when you switch, you have a lot of difficulty. And I don't think students know this. I don't think it makes, I don't, I don't think they maybe have had articulated or have actually um, internally said every time my phone goes off, it cost me switch time. Right. I don't know if they've had the experience uh, to, to really know the difference. Right. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So I think that's a really good point. Like as we think about student development, this is a really good thing to conversation to have with a student. Like yeah. when have you been your best? Uh, when you think about taking an exam, what was the, what, how did you set yourself up for success in that? I don't know that they know how to do it without being distracted. Yeah. The other thing that happens is the screw up effect. So when you have to, when you're distracted and then you come back to your task you can't just automatically pick up where you left off. You have to backtrack and then you have to move forward on your line and then you have to find where you stopped and then you have to continue that line. And so in that process, it's way more likely that you are going to make a mistake. Like you're going to not end up exactly the same place or you're going to take a path off because you don't remember where the line was going, right? It just reminds me like when I'm reading a book, I'm in the middle of reading a book. One of my kids comes up to me and I close my book. I forgot to put in a bookmark and then I've got to go back and kind of this approximation of where I was. Oh, yeah. no, I, I don't know why that's happening. I need to go back. And then I, I found my spot, but I wasn't really paying attention on the last paragraph. So I have to reread exactly. what was the context of that. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's the screw up effect where you're just like every time I have to start and restop, I give myself an opportunity to make a mistake. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one is creative drain, which this one makes me really sad, but I think it's so important. That is that new thoughts and innovations come when your brain makes connections from things that you've learned or seen or heard or thought independently. And you have to have time and space for those, for those thoughts to like find their way together and make a connection in your brain that then gives you something new. And if you don't have time for those things to like meander around in your mind and grab the hand of somebody that they've never been connected to before, then you can't be innovative and creative, right? You yeah. just have to like sit in wonder and boredom 
and see what comes out of it. You and I have talked for a long time about the idea that pressure does not bring creativity. It's actually the enemy of creativity. Hurry up and think of something creative. Okay. I, I, that's not going to work, right? I need time to just like marinate in what's happening in my brain. And if we're constantly distracted, we don't have the time to just be. Right. And again, um, we're in a place right now where we can't afford to be so distracted. We've got big problems to solve, a lot, a lot of complicated issues that need good thinkers. And so when, when you think about all of that, we, we need to be creative to solve these issues. Yeah. So when I'm thinking about talking to students, I'm making a case for them, right? I'm saying like, do you know, every time you get a notification or you get a distraction, you have these different, you have switch costs, you have the, your screw up effect and you have creativity brain. This is why I'm saying it's important to create space where you are not distracted from what's going on. It's good. Another element that I just throw in there that is related to distraction, but I think even more related to, to this idea of stolen focus is the idea that, that many people these days are spending so much time broadcasting and no time receiving. So by that, I mean, you are constantly focused on what you are doing, what you can tell other people you're doing. Um, the Johan in his book said, I would be sitting in the beginning, I would be sitting looking at a sunset and I would be thinking in my brain, if I took this picture, here's how I would caption it so everyone could see it, right? You're constantly thinking about how do I create content for other people to consume yeah. instead of being present with the sunset and being like, what is it like for me right now to be in the, I'm, I'm receiving this sunset without thinking about how I can chop that into a bite-sized piece that somebody else can get. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems about that is <laughs> I, I want to call it like the middle school effect, which you know how in middle school, everybody thinks they are the only person that, that people are paying Everyone's attention to. Thinking about, right. Yeah. So like you're in a group and you're not thinking like, Oh, that person feels embarrassed and they feel straight. You're just like, everybody's looking at me thinking I'm stupid because I said the wrong thing. And I remember when Aiden was in middle school, we talked to him about like, if you will look at the people around you and just try to figure out what they're feeling and say a thing about it, first of all, it alleviates your narcissism, but also you look amazing because they're not used to being seen in that yeah, way, right? That such a great example because it, it really, I mean, um, not only changed Aiden and the way he looked at people, even in middle school, but, uh, I know a specific student, it changed that student's experience completely in middle yeah. school. So, and you were yeah, talking really about powerful. the, the like step forward of not just asking questions of other people and being present with other people, but then also extending them empathy. Yeah. So the, the thing I love and, and that Johan points out in this book is, is like empathy is the finest example of paying attention. So the getting to a place where you're developing empathy, um, it, it requires to have empathy. It requires that you're paying attention to other people. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> I, I was thinking about this, uh, talks about in, in the book about the, you know, when, when you take the time to read a, a good book, as you're reading a good book, as opposed to like a, a, a tweet, when you're reading a good book, you start connecting with characters and, and having some empathy for the characters in the book. And, and I was telling you, I'm, I'm reading Watership Down, which is a classic and it's, it's about rabbits. But man, I'm connected to these rabbits. And there's, <laughs> I'm, I mean it. But it, it's, ta it's been a while since I've, I've thought, I've never thought about the emotions of a rabbit uh, until reading this book. But it was such a great reminder that when you slow down and you start looking at other people, paying attention to what's going on, then the, a, a really clear outcome of that is empathy, which is the complete opposite of what a stolen focus person, a, a person who's focused on broadcasting and creating content is, right? They're focused on themselves, not looking at other people. So when you look at your students and you're like, hey, you need to like keep kind of back up and put yourself in perspective of all of these other people. I think that starts with slowing down and, and um, start starting to 
pay attention to the so, details. Of yeah, you and I were just talking to some Res Life staff and they were like, we are having to reteach our students how to be present with one another because they don't want to because it's hard. They it's a it is a thing you have to practice to pay attention to other people. And so how do you teach people to be in community when they would rather just be distracted? Right. It's it is a depth of thinking that you have to create space and presence to be with other people versus I can just be in my room and pretend like I'm with people. I get I broadcast and I get these distant signals that are hearts or likes or whatever that I'm doing a good okay. job. Totally different. It is a shallow distraction versus rich, deep community, which is what we're trying yeah. to teach our students. That's good. So I want to spend our last few minutes talking about flow because part of what this book says is there's there's two elements. There's like you have to not be distracted, but then if you don't fill that in with something, then you're not being successful. Then you're just like, okay, what do I do with my life? So he talks about this thing um, called flow, which is what you replace your distractions with. And it really is about purchase versus practice. So practice is if you think about like painting or rock climbing or cooking or playing chess, it's hard and it's painful and it changes you and you're learning and you're conquering things in yourself. But the real reward in that is the process that you are engaged in. It's not so much the outcome. So this is true for me with cooking. I can't tell you how many hours I will spend cooking a meal. And then when it gets on the table, I'm kind of done with it. Like, I mean, I want to eat it. Like, I want to know how it tastes. But like, the joy <clears throat> for me is the hours and hours of this process of like, can I do it? Will it come out right? And then once it's done, I'm like, okay, there it was, right? I'm, I don't even take pictures because that's not the point. The point is I spent all day doing this thing that I really love. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, mine's fly fishing. When I think about flow, being in a place where you start to slow down and really focus on a craft. Fly fishing is mine. And, and the thing about it is, and such a difference, it's, I've never been able to articulate why fly fishing is my thing and not sitting in a boat bass fishing. Um, but the difference is you can't be distracted. If you're distracted fly fishing, you're not going to catch fish. Um, you're not going to enjoy the moment and the, and the place and, and all the things, the beauty of, of these fish. So um, yeah. And that whole, at the end of the day, I mean, I kind of care if I caught a fish, <laughs> but, but just being there and that being in that art is worth it. Even yeah. if I don't catch a fish. Yeah. So when we're defining flow, we're talking about, you're not conquering anything mm -hmm. other than yourself. Basically you're trying, you're, you're doing your best in this thing. It's very process oriented. You are not looking for a hit or a sugar high or a peak or a utopia. You are really happy in the process of whatever you're doing. And Matt, you and I are talking about this in terms of our um, hobbies that we like, but this can be true at work. Right. When I am in a place where I'm designing a new part of our technology, I'm 100 yeah. percent in flow. I'm like, what is the problem we're trying to define? What are the tools we have? How, right. So you can do that within work. Um, what the three requ requirements of flow is that you have a clearly defined goal. You are setting everything aside and using all of your brain power to pursue this thing right now. OK, so that's the first. The second is you're doing something that is meaningful. If it is not meaningful to you, you are not going to be able to have that singular focus that puts you in flow. You're going to be like, this is stupid. I don't know why I'm doing it. Right. And then the third one is that you have to be, you have to be doing something that's at the edge of your abilities, but not beyond it. So if you say to me like, hey, why don't you go climb Mount Everest? I'm never going to be in flow there because that's beyond <laughs> my ability. Like I cannot do that. But if you say... Hey, will you cook a beef Wellington, which is very hard to do, yeah. but I can do it. Yes. That's a place where I would be in flow, right? It would take me all day, but I, I can embrace that. And it's meaningful to me. It's good. So what flow looks like teaching our students, what that's like and creating space for them to be able to pursue it. What's nice for this um, brain space of flow is that it's purely present mm -hmm. It is only about what I am doing right now in this pro process to accomplish this thing. And you totally lose your self-consciousness. So I was thinking, Matt, about when we went fishing in Alaska, we had a client in Alaska and we went and we went fishing on the river. 
And I'm like super, I'm pretty, I'm pretty private and I'm pretty self-conscious and I'm like pretty embarrassed about not being good at a thing. But that's a case where I didn't feel self-conscious because I didn't care what anyone was doing because I was paying attention and trying to catch the salmon, right? So it's a really great example of you're not aware of all of the people making judgments about is is that person doing a good job? Is it not? You're just like, hey, there is nothing in my head right now except this gorgeous salmon that I'm trying to get in the boat, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which just I did a great job and caught five. It helps to have a guy that puts you right on top of the salmon. Anyway, that idea of a loss of self-consciousness, I think not not self-consciousness, but self, yeah, self-consciousness is where you know you are in the flow. It doesn't matter who's around. I am wholly focused on this individual thing. And it has to be protected, right? That's something that you were talking about. Yeah, I just think I think that so as as you've described, it's so easy and we're kind of we we are going to wrestle against being in flow, like, hey, oh, that's a distraction. I can break out of it. So it needs to be protected as sacred time because it's so easy to disrupt. It's so fragile. It's just very fragile. And and like when I when I'm on a stream and I'm fishing, if I've got all my notifications popping off and my sounds on, and and you know, and I start to check my email. Then I start to think not about fishing, but now I'm back at work and I'm thinking about all the things that I should be doing or all the things that I let go that I shouldn't have let go. Right. And you're not you you break flow. And so then you you go right back into this fragmented kind of life. And so it needs to be protected. Yeah. So I was just thinking about how perhaps what we need to do is reframe that from a luxury to a necessity. Because the places where I feel like, so, you know, every year for my birthday, I throw a birthday party where I cook all day long. I cook whatever I want to. And it is a birthday present to me because it is a luxury. I never am like all day long. I'm going to just cook because that makes me feel happy. Um, But can you imagine if we reframe that and said, that is not a luxury for you to give yourself that time to be in flow, but actually a necessity in our work to be able to say, sorry, I cannot do anything else on Wednesday because it is necessary that I am engaged in deep thinking to solve big problems that are going to be facing us in the coming time. I mean, Johan would absolutely say that. Like he, he's pretty much, you know, you should set aside a day each week to, to do this at least one day. So, um, so, okay, let's bring this home. So I think I wonder if our students who are in stress and social isolation and feeling overwhelmed and feeling anxious, I wonder if that is an outcome of years of distraction and fragmented thinking, even beyond COVID, I think maybe that exacerbated it. But I think that that, I think social media puts them in a place where there's always something else, right, for them to be able to see and be distracted by. And Weaning ourselves from the sort of empty calories of this fractured, distracted um, brain space and moving towards deep thinking and this flow place where you are pr- fully present in the process takes a lot of discipline and it has to be intentional. And I don't know how we would be expected to wander into the space where all of a sudden we just have time to have this deep thinking. And yeah. how we could ever imagine that our students would wander into that space without some coaching. Um, and so I have been thinking, if I had students right now, I would be having a lot of conversation about easiest versus best. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have talked for a long time on cap and gown about how students are like, I want to do Zoom. I want to be able to drop in whenever I want to. I just want to text with you. I don't want to come to your office. I was talking to someone the other day. She was like, I'm chasing people down because I want them to come into my office. And I would preface conversations with students by saying, I know it is easier for you to come in and Zoom. Like, I understand that's easier. I don't think it's best. I yeah. think what's best is for you to come into the room with me. And I have caveats about, of course, you need to be available when students need you and those sorts of things. And in some cases, Zoom is going to be the only option that they have. But saying... Mm-hmm. It's a little bit harder for us to be in this room together, but I think it's better. And 
when students come to see you, because you said it's better for us to be in the room together, that you say, let's take our phones and put them face down for 20 minutes and work really hard on solving this problem. Because I have confidence that if you and I for 20 minutes are in flow and doing deep thinking about how we can help you succeed, we are going to come up with something genius, right? Yeah, I think that's great. I think it really... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it really comes down to two choices, right? So um, to be able to present to them, there's this flow, which I, I love the idea of flow is, is you're expanding, you're, you're growing, it's bigger, it's deeper, it's calmer. And, and this fragmented life that we're living is this shrinking, smaller, shallower, and angrier life, yeah. right? that we just have all these little things attacking us all the time and not kind of creating that space for ourselves to really grow and expand. So to be able to lay that out for a student and say, okay, we're going to take time. And I, and I want to model that because I, I just think that um, that's really important. I, I don't know where students are seeing that or getting that modeling um, right now. Yeah. And, you know, I love efficiency. It's my most favorite thing. But I will just say that I have been wholly convinced over the last two years that there is no substitute for people being in a room together. So we have people that we work with that I talk to for hours a day. We do Zoom. We're in meetings. We Hours a day I talk to them. And when I am in the same room with them, it is a completely different experience. We work differently. We relate differently. We Everything about it is different. And so I think yeah. saying to a student, yes, there is a distracted, fractured piece where we can do Zoom together and I can be connected to you. And that's better than nothing, 100%. But being in a same, the same room together will change your focus because you just have so much more information. Like you can see everything about what's happening with them. So I think that's that right. conversation is really helpful to have. Okay, action items. Let's go. Let's Here you go. Them. Number one. Uh, where can you talk to your students about the difference between distraction and fractured thinking and mm -hmm. flow? This is absolutely student development. I think it is a really important, when I think about all of the emphasis on like adulting classes, I would put this in there. Hey, part of adulting is you have to figure out a way to run your life in a way that you can solve big, important problems yeah. by deep thinking, right? Number two, make a list of the things that distract you from deep thinking. I'm going to do this. I, um, Scout's honor. I was a brownie. Did you know that when I was five? I was I didn't a brownie. Know that. Scout's honor. I'm going to go and just make a list of what are all the notifications that come on my phone and how many of them can I turn off? Make a list of everything that distracts you in a day. Um, next, where can you block off times where you will have uninterrupted time to develop deep and creative thinking? So deep and creative, creative thinking and also... Where can you block off times to have uninterrupted time to develop deep and creative relationships? Because those are two places that, that really suffer from distractions. Um, you just think about sitting, having coffee with somebody, and they're constantly looking at their phone. That is not a deep relationship that we are having right now. That is a distracted relationship and all the yeah. signals that you're sending about that. So where is there time where we can spend in good thinking and good relationship building? And how do we teach our students to do that as well? And then the last thing is make a list of the things that put you in flow. Where are the places where you're just like, man, I am focused on this process. It is hard, but it is important work. And how do we change our attitude from that is such a luxury when I get to do that to that is an absolute necessity for me to be able to live a fulfilled, um, important life, not only professionally, but also personally. Anything you want to add to that? Oh, the only thing I would add to that is invest in a new thing. You know, I mean, think of a new thing to invest in. Uh, maybe it's fly fishing. If it's on a great river, um, <laughs> now we'll come and you teach you how to do happy it. <laughs> to come, happy to come teach. But at the end of the day, I, I think this this conversation of like really canceling out the noise is so important. Um, it's in a lot of ways it's obvious, but we're just not we're not investing in it, and 
hopefully this is a great spark for that. This is there's a lot more conversation to come on this topic. Yeah, I think for it's, sure. It's it is one. it is a discipline of pursuing joy for sure, right? Yeah. It is a commitment to making our lives joyful and meaningful and deep and worthy. So thank you guys for joining us. We will see you next week.